Okay, well, we have lots of great information to share with you guys today. So I um, want to be respectful of everyone's time so we can go ahead and get started. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to part two um, in our webinar series on the topic of programs versus PSC. We're very excited to dive back into this topic and hear from our presenters. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few brief announcements. If at any time throughout the webinar you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the chat box by clicking on the chat icon on the bottom of your screen. We will have time to address your questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties, you can also type them into the chat box and I'll do my best to resolve them throughout the webinar. And finally, the webinar is being recorded, so please keep your microphone muted for the duration of the presentation and we will share the recording link with you next week. So we are fortunate enough today to have two presenters. Today we're gonna hear from Dr. Reed from Furman University followed by Sarah King from Clemson University. Um, before I turn it over to them, um, I wanna walk through really quick the objectives of the webinar. So uh, we have two objectives today. Attendees will have a clear understanding of how health education programming and PSC um, strategies can work collaboratively together to promote specific health behaviors. And secondly, um, we hope that you will leave being able to demonstrate how PSC approaches differ from one community to the next, um, depending on resources and asset, assets available during implementation. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to um, Dr. Reed, and while he's getting set up, let me share a little bit about his background. So Dr. Reed is a professor in the Department of Health Sciences at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, and is an affiliate of the Preven Prevention Research Center in the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Reed holds a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies from Colbert and William Smith Colleges, a Master of Science in Exercise and Sports Sciences from the University of Miami, a Doctorate in Exercise and Sports Sciences from the University of North Colorado, and most recently received his MPH from the University of South Carolina. Dr. Reed's research focuses on examining links between physical activity and cognitive function of youth, as well as investigating associations between the built environment and physical activity. He has disseminated his research in the Journal of Physical Activity and Health, Prevention and Medicine, Preventing Chronic Disease, and the Journal of American College Health. Dr. Reed is also the author of Active Education, Lessons for Integrating Physical Activity with Language Arts, Math, Science, and Social Studies, and his most recent book, Activating the Modern Classroom. Reed is the co-founder of Active Ed, and its product, Walkabouts. Walkabouts are an on-demand adventure that transforms math, language arts, and reading content into short movement-rich activities for pre-K through second grade students. This research-based online tool makes it easy for teachers and parents to create lessons that bring key concepts, concepts to life through physical activity. Walkabouts even correlate to the state standards teachers already use to develop and manage their lesson plans. Plus, unlike traditional videos, walkabouts are dynamic and different every time they play. At this point, I'll pass things over to Dr. Reed. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can I will hear assume you. so. Uh, I'm going to talk about three different projects today and how they relate from a programmatic perspective to a policy perspective. So the first is Legacy Early College, and those of you familiar um, with Legacy know about its focus on health. It is a school that is 99% free and reduced lunch, under-resourced children, but they believe strongly that zip code should, do not, should not determine one's outcome. And from its onset, decided health and physical education are essential and develop policies to provide daily physical education for all children kindergarten through eighth grade. So I'll talk a little bit about that program. Uh, Walkabouts, as you, you just heard, is a program slash uh, platform that is allowing teachers to teach what they already teach in the classroom with physical activity to meet current standards in math and language arts. As we know from a policy perspective, and I teach health policy at Furman, and I talk to my students, 
um, policy is always changing, of course, based on data and making modifications. Unfortunately, current policies in, in most states do not provide enough physical education and movement opportunities throughout the school day that often the classroom teacher could be the best individual to get more movement because the PE teacher, especially at the elementary school level, is only seeing their kids once a week and in some states every other week. But as we know, instruction time is essential. And to lose instruction time is a huge barrier to getting movement in the classroom. So this platform was designed to allow teachers to teach what they already teach with movement, things that kids in elementary school typically like to do. And then those movements help to tell the teacher if they're getting the concepts or not. And then the third is now the Prisma Health System Swamp Rabbit Trail, formerly the Greenville Health System Swamp Rabbit Trail. And we're talking about how the built environment has modified and, and changed behaviors. Ultimately, why I'm so interested in this work from a program and a policy perspective is data helps to drive policy, as we all know. But since policy is constantly changing and making modifications, we could be implementing policies that then we need to get data to ensure that those policies are effective and then they're meeting the needs of those in which the policy was intended. So get to the next slide here. So with, with legacy, we, we've been looking at um, the school since 2009 and, and we have a couple control schools as well that are also Title I schools. I'm just gonna be presenting some of that data from a, an aerobic capacity standpoint, but we've been, we've been examining um, BMI, we've been examining uh, fitness outside of aerobic capacity, muscular strength, muscular endurance, um, as well as a variety of cognitive measures. And currently we just looked at some data on how muscular endurance as a predictor for academic achievement on the past test. But right now I'm gonna talk about um, aerobic capacity. And as I mentioned before, Legacy is one of the only schools, if not the only school in South Carolina providing 45 minutes of daily physical education, um, K through eight, and is a under-resourced school. The point of why we wanted to look at aerobic capacity, which is we know physical activity and fitness are, are different, but the, the research is pretty clear now that uh, low cardiorespiratory fitness is, if not the greatest contributor to mortality, one of those. And as you can see, kids, are their fitness levels um, are decreasing. And we know you look at 4% of elementary schools in the country and 8% of middle schools in the country are providing daily PE. So the point of, of this school is to not only provide those opportunities for kids, but also taking this data to then apply it at a state level to change policy in South Carolina to improve the health of kids that are attending school who are not getting enough movement opportunities. So longitudinally, it's been very exciting to be able to look at this data of course, um, a lot of the population uh, of legacy, as well as our control skills, uh, control schools, excuse me, is a transient population, but we have been able to follow kids um, for quite some time. And some of this data was recently presented with my colleague, uh, Morgan Huey, who is a former Furman student, now a professor at the College of Charleston at the Active Living Conference. So we wanted to get an idea of how aerobic capacity is changing um, over time. And so with the control school, um, well, really two control schools, an elementary and a middle, and then looking at legacy, which gets daily. The control schools, elementary was only getting PE one day a week, and the control middle school was only getting PE 
uh, for every day, but only for the fall semester. So as what I just explained here, the, the school um, for the middle school did get a little bit more, five more minutes uh, of PE, but it was only for the fall, whereas the elementary was just getting it um, one day a week. What we were using in this particular part of the study, uh, we were using fitness gram uh, as our measurement. Um, we also use pedometers to measure physical activity. Um, and as I mentioned in the onset, you know, fitness and activity are, are two different things and, and fitness can be impacted um, by heredity. So where uh, is an outcome, whereas physical activity is a behavior. Nonetheless, fitness gram is the most widely used uh, fitness battery throughout the country and is being used extensively um, in, in South Carolina. So both of the schools uh, are using the PACER test, which is the progressive aerobic cardiovascular endurance run. I'm sure some of you are, or all of you are familiar with that. <clears throat> and we would go into the schools and, and administer that, although the, you know, the PE teachers are more than qualified, um, but from a research perspective, we wanted to make sure we were all doing it um, the correct way. And then looking at, you know, grade and age and gender, um, and then and then race and ethnicity. Um, so we built some models on what is happening over time with aerobic capacity. And aerobic capacity is just so important when we're talking about overall health. So we had a few different models that we were putting together along with our descriptive statistics. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time, but just kind of wanna show you what some of those models look like. So from a descriptive standpoint, you can see we had about 466 students. Um, you can see, you know, what the, the average age um, was, and then you can see the breakdown here from male and female, and then you see the breakdown um, of uh, from a race ethnicity standpoint. You know what is what is happening um, at Legacy it, from a demography standpoint is quite different than the controls. Although the controls were Title One, they weren't necessarily um, the same demography, and you know that we're doing the best that we can for comparison purposes. But if you look at, at this first figure, and it says, you know, the predicted aerobic capacity average for males and females over a five, uh, over a five year time period, and then we adjusted um, for, for your age, ethnicity, and, and the school um, that is attended right now, and you can see, you know, males, based on age and their predicted aerobic capacity is going up, whereas females you see um, is going down. And that, that is consistent with the literature as we know, as kids matriculate into middle school, especially girls, um, physical activity decreases. And there's a whole host of reasons for that, not necessarily to get in here, some of those are are physiological and some are those are psychosocial. Um, as a father of three girls, I, I'm very concerned with how the trends of physical activity among boys and girls in, in many cases decreases, but it, it is more demonstrative among girls. But you can see here with, with males um, going up and then with females going down. Then we look at what is happening with the experimental or the intervention school compared to, um, you know, the comparison school. And as you can see here now with the intervention from the policy of putting in daily PE, we are seeing those predicted aerobic capacity going up, whereas we are seeing the comparison school similar to the slide before. and. Daily PE, based on what we're seeing here, it is able to demonstrate, hey, it is contributing to this predicted 
uh, model adjusted for many of the things that you would say, okay, is there, what's the difference for age, what's going on with gender and what's going on with race and ethnicity. And so from a policy perspective, although we are looking at, you know, not a huge sample, but we're able to say, hey, you know, here's a program if you want to think of it that way, but it's still policy related in the sense of the school saying, hey, this is really important to us. But if we use that and then we go and show this to policymakers and we say, hey, look what's happening in South Carolina overall from a health perspective of, of our youth. It's not very good, nor is it very good for our adults. And we have some data to say, hey, look at this over time, over a five year period, these kids who are under resourced, um, are, but they're getting daily PE in a healthy environment are performing uh, quite well from an aerobic capacity standpoint compared to their controls. And, and this is also similar when we look at um, some of the cognitive data. So getting back is taking this data to then drive policy, which I think is, is so important because when you go to policymakers and you say, hey, we need to do this, one of the first questions they ask is, okay, show me the data. How is that, how is the data going to be able to inform or even start the development of the policy? Then you implement the policy and of course, then you want to get data again to see if we need to make any potential modifications. So we saw significant differences and males demonstrated significant increases uh, with aerobic capacity while females was a decline when we were talking about the entire sample. But then when we get into um, looking at the intervention, um, we saw that the intervention school, the daily PE was, was seeing the significant increases compared to the controls. So aerobic capacity from a health perspective is a great measure. Um, and, and we know it is a great predictor uh, of overall health. And school policy can influence um, aerobic fitness. And, and, and in this case, the study populations, it did so. So this is just one study showing, hey, a school makes a policy decision and let's see it over time. And that that hypothesis, you know, from the research standpoint, we, we thought that's what we would necessarily see compared to schools that don't provide it. Then taking that and talking to um, policymakers, and we have, we, we've shared this data throughout. Um, of course, there's a variety of reasons why um, policies haven't been put in place to provide daily PE throughout the state, but we're hopeful that things will continue to change as more and more folks realize the importance. It's just a picture uh, of the kids um, from Legacy. So the next one um, is about walkabouts and, and the company I, I started called um, Active Ed and a little backstory there. I actually tried to start it as a nonprofit organization, but to build the software to, to be able to do it was uh, over a million dollars. So unfortunately I, I had to say, okay, take a different approach. Let's, let's look at maybe taking it uh, as a company and, and getting people to, to invest, to help us that are passionate about kids. So our, our, our mission, you know, is to improve learning and health through physical activity and education. It means kids spend the majority of their waking day uh, hours at school. And that's why schools have always been a great place to intervene. Um, however, teachers have a primary responsibility to educate and have to meet those standards. And, and my wife's a teacher and we ask teachers to do so much um, and often not fair to them without providing the resources for them to do their job effectively. But we do know kids are at school and that's why schools are ripe for intervention. So this is just a real a picture of what we do is we have a platform in which we, we have a couple characters that take kids on a journey with math and language arts and the movements that the kids do tell the teacher if they're getting the concepts or not, but the content changes every time. So it's not like a video. Um, the, the numbers, if you're doing math um, changes and then the 
words change if you're doing language arts and that way kids can't memorize and the kids get also unlimited access um, at home. Um, so it's a supplement and, and we know we all have different learning styles, but um, we do see data that uh, the cognitive performance of kids um, has gone down where we those uh, studies that have shown, you know, with physical activity have shown some really interesting things related to um, physical activity and educational outcomes. You know, many of you have probably seen this slide from my colleague Chuck Hillman, um, who's now at um, Northeastern University, what, but when this study came out was at the University of Illinois, and just trying to demonstrate what is happening just with light activity and how the brain um, is lit up and is ready to learn. And I'm sure some of you've read Dr. Rady's book, Spark, and as well as others that have demonstrated, you know, movement has not only a positive impact on overall cognition, and we know the, the physiological benefits, but it also has a, a impact on behavior. And, and Iowa State University um, looked at our program and, found, and uh, UC Irvine found that kids who use it increase their focus. So this is just kind of giving you a screenshot of just how simple it is. You know, you, you pick a grade, you pick a subject area, and then you pick a standard. And then we have the each state has its own correlations to make sure teachers can say, hey, I, I'm meeting my standards without losing instruction time. And it, you know, takes the kids on a adventure. And here you can see, look at all those correlations in the center um, for this particular math operation. And so here was, okay, from a policy perspective as well, how do we get more classroom physical activity? Well, the first thing principals ask is, of course, is, you know, I have a limited amount of time. Um, how is this going to impact instruction time? And what, what we've seen nationally from a policy is that schools that have started to implement more physical activity opportunities have seen improvements in behavior and have seen some improvements in, in academic performance and achievement. And that's ultimately what a principal is evaluated on, right? And administrators evaluated on their ability to provide quality education, which unfortunately, like it or not, this is the test at the end of the year. Now, we're obviously not doing it this year for um, COVID, but at the end of the year, those, those scores do matter to how policymakers at the state level um, look at education. So once we, the field has been able to demonstrate um, that it does have an effect, you start to get more buy-in um, from those administrators. So as I mentioned before, the research, you know, we, we found that hyperactivity went down, improved performance went up, and, and we also saw an increase in, in focus. So that was really exciting for me as a researcher and someone interested in also changing policy just because policy can have such a greater impact to see effectiveness. The last program um, is, is the Swamp Rabbit Trail. And, you know, the Swamp Rabbit Trail has been a huge success now referred to as the Prisma Swamp Rabbit Trail. But this was a great example of changing the environment, changing behavior. You know, I, I would say the, the Swamp Rabbit is the uh, the greatest public health built environment, public health intervention in the upstate by far and a big believer of built environment interventions because they are once you build it, obviously you have to maintain it, but it, it is there versus just putting in a necessarily a, a program. However, you can also marry the two. We have seen programs that have been developed on the. Swamp Rabbit Trail. So a couple of things to, to give you an idea of just how change occurred is this is Traveler's Rest, some pictures um, before the Swamp Rabbit, and that's that same intersection after. So went on a road diet, we, we took a couple lanes down. You know, Traveler's Rest played a major role in this and spent well over a million two, I think, with a streetscape change. Um, so another before, and then you get it an after, you know, changing that environment, making it much more aesthetically pleasing, also putting a buffer to the road, uh, 
um, as you can see here, and then that road diet is shown and you can see the pavers and really that that streetscape making it much more aesthetically pleasing. Another example. Um, and, and if you've been up into TR, I mean, the trail is extraordinarily popular. Another before and another after. Now having you know Main Street, and then you have a green space as well as a a linear park with the trail. Um, you know, Traveler's Rest was often a pass through, and now it's become a destination. You know, from uh, an investment standpoint, you know, forty new businesses um, located on Main Street in the past four years. Uh, property owners have have seen significant improvements. You see a new business here. And with these new businesses, you see people using physical activity and biking. 86% of our users on the Swamp Rabbit are bikers and people biking um, to this restaurant. You know, new business, another new business, um, another new business. Just showing you how the trail dramatically impacted and you see the people using pedestrian activity um, to get to a particular area. We have the Swamp Rabbit 5K now. So, you know, built environment changing behavior, but then behavior changing the built environment. You see people moving closer to the trail. You see people conducting business at places that they wouldn't necessarily have uh, previously. Here is just to, you know, kind of give you some some data, right? Because a big part of it is, okay, you, we, we built this trail, um, who's using it, right? And and so here's just, we had five different methodologies and I'm presenting um, kind of four of the data sources, but we use direct observation. You know, we went out there and, and we were present uh, throughout the day on a given week, every season. Um, and we had we counted. Um, we did survey data by stopping people, referred to as intercept surveys. Um, you'll see some of that data. We also um, hired a marketing company to do a random digit dial of non-users as well as users. Um, we did focus groups um, of users, and we tried to recruit non-users. And then we did you know business interviews. So here is just showing you, okay, 2011 users, and then it went up in 2012, and then you can see it went up in 2013, and then kind of stayed the same roughly in, in 2014. And, and you're seeing the breakdown, um, male versus female. Typically, actually, in the literature, females use trails more than males. I think part of the why this is a little bit different here was the the large cycling community, and there we just observed more male cycling than we did females. Um, then we look at okay, what is happening here from uh, age, and this is where we say okay, look who we're seeing. We're primarily seeing adults. You know what what policies do we need to be putting in place? to get teens and to get children. And, you know, right now I'm actually working on a, a paper with uh, CDC, NIH, and um, NCOR, which is the National uh, Collaborative uh, Coalition on Child Obesity Research, looking at what trails among under-resourced youth. Why are we not seeing kids throughout the country children and youth using trails, and, and, and this data demonstrates that. We, we primarily are seeing adults um, and, uh, you know, senior citizens compared to, to children. So that, that is a real gap in, in the literature. More data than just going back to ethnicity. I mean, 90% of the users uh, on the Swamp Rabbit are, are Caucasian. But the census tracts and the blocks that abut the Swamp Rabbit are very diverse. So what is in the environment that is preventing? Well, this segment is from Traveler's Rest down to downtown Greenville. We know there are very few safe access points along the trail um, where people can feel comfortable either biking or walking to access the trail. And so, 
we have this great amenity, but it has to be safe for people in those communities to be able to get access. And although we're, we're getting there, you know, that comes to saying, okay, Paul, we need policies in place where we, when we're building a new road or we retrofit, you know, nobody likes to hear the term complete streets, but, you know, complete streets is not asking you to retro. It's asking you and when you were thinking about a new street to be thinking about all those different users. So data here is saying, okay, well, why are we only seeing, um, you know, 90% Caucasian? We did have one year when it went, um, you know, we had an, an increase in minority users, but for the most part, it is saying high Caucasian population, but significantly more when you look at the census data for Greenville. So from direct observation, you can see 80% observed uh, compared to 70% of females, so 80% of males, 70% of females, 14% of males, uh, females walking versus 7% of males walking. That's consistent in the literature of females enjoy walking necessarily more than males. Um, you can see when people were being observed, uh, you know, temperature weather impacts uh, use. Um, so we wanted to see how that impacted. And you might think, well, how, how does that impact policy? You could be putting things in place of making sure their water, making sure their benches, making sure there's more trees to provide coverage. Um, you can see people use the trail during lunch hour. Well, that's a great way to say um, to businesses, hey, can you, can you further make sure that your um, employees potentially have, are able to take a, a break during their lunch to, to get more physical activity? Um, you see the use on, on weekends, um, which we went to business folks and said, hey, Saturdays and Sundays, you need to make sure you, you are open. Um, then we had our intercept survey data and our random digit dial. Um, and this is saying you look at males report the safety and security of the trail to be good, to be excellent compared to good among females. Well, that's important then when we look at maybe you talk to law enforcement and, and you say, hey, um, I know you're patrolling the trail. Can we potentially increase the hours of that to, to make sure everyone is feeling as safe as they can? Um, so just data that is then helping to potentially, you know, change, change policy. Um, same thing here when we're, we're looking at, okay, where are people coming from? What do they perceive it to be well-maintained? You know, 57% of uh, female, 48% of males um, reported maintenance of the trails excellent. Um, you know, you got, but it should be higher than that. Um, if, if you don't feel like it's well maintained, then you're you're less likely uh, to use it. So the point of you know just kind of showing you you know some of this data is then you take this data and go back to the policymakers who who maintain the trail like the city of greenville and the county and, and go okay this is this is what we're seeing can we can we make some changes um we also ask people to to self-rate their health um in the surveys and 25 percent of respondents uh reported you know using the trail 64 percent overweight or obese and approximately half of participants reported self-related health um high self-related health. Um, we found trail users were half as likely to be overweight or obese than non-users. Okay, maybe, maybe we need to be building more trails and in closer proximity, trail users uh, two and a half times more likely to report high self-rated health. So this then goes back to, okay, if we're seeing this from a policy standpoint, you're building a new development. Should we be requiring more green space? Should we be requiring builders to put in walking trails? Um, so the, this data then helps to, to drive policy decisions. And then here in my last slide, for those not using the trail, is we, we tried to find out, okay, what, what were some of their reasons? And it might not be that easy to, to see here, and, and, and I'm happy to get this, this map out to those who want, but we start seeing, okay, you know, not interested is it was black and the gr darker green was too far away. When you start seeing that, you go, oh, it's too far away from me. 
does not have the features I want, is it inadequately maintained? We see quite a bit of that. Then you see red in here, not even aware of the trail, which is hard to believe when you think about it sometimes. And, and the trail itself is that green right there. And I'm, I'm going to be wrapping up here um, shortly. But, you know, because the, the county and the city have promoted the trail tremendously, but there are still people who are, who are not necessarily aware. So the point here of this presentation was to, to show you how, um, and I'm going to try to stop sharing here, how programs uh, complement policy and, and policy complements programs and, and they work hand in hand. And I'm happy to uh, answer any questions after uh, Sarah presents. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. And we'll let Sarah pull her slides up. Um, and while she's doing that, I will read her bio. So Sarah is a program coordinator within Clemson University's Youth Learning Institute, SNAPED. She works to implement both health education programming and PSC changes that focus on healthy eating and active living throughout 16 counties in South Carolina. Sarah had the privilege of receiving her master's in public health from the University of South Carolina and a bachelor of science in history and health sciences at Furman University before working with Clemson. During that time, she was able to study how sustain sustainable environmental changes can positively influence the overall health of a community. As part of her desire to work within the upstate and western regions of South Carolina, Sarah and her team work to provide a combination of knowledge, skills, and supportive environmental strategies to promote healthy habits among SNAP-Ed participants and community members. Perfect, thank you so much, Kelsey, and hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you all today. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Well, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with me, as Kelsey stated, I am Sarah King, and I am one of the program coordinators within Clemson University YLI SNAP Ed program. Um, but we refer to ourselves as Clemson SNAP Ed for short. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with the SNAP Ed program, or those of us at Clemson, um, we work in being able to provide health education as well as PSC opportunities to those who qualify or are eligible for the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And we are able to do so through various health education programs, as well as coalition work within the communities that we serve um, and partnerships throughout those communities as well. Now, SNAP-Ed has been around for many years in providing health education focused on the nutrition and physical activity areas. Prior to 2017, we would often get feedback from our participants saying that they enjoyed the class, the knowledge that they gained, and the skills that they developed. But it was very hard for them to apply that after um, the class had been completed into their own lives due to lack of infrastructure or environmental supports or even policy regulations. And so in 2017, SNAP decided to incorporate the PSC in addition to the health education portion of it in order to form healthier lifestyles for our SNAP Ed participants moving forward. And so Clemson for the state of South Carolina is actually only one out of the four implementing agencies that work to provide these opportunities throughout the state. We have colleagues at the University of South Carolina, South Carolina DHEC, as well as Low Country Food Bank uh, to provide SNAP Ed and be able to provide similar opportunities throughout. For those of us here at Clemson, we focus on 16 counties here in the state of South Carolina, that range from the upstate down to the western portion of South Carolina, as well as Clarendon County to the side, as you can see in the image here. But even though we offer um, various health education programs, there are six main programs that we focus on um, to provide to our participants. And they all range in different areas in terms of specialties, and they can be tailored to certain populations. But we are able to provide either a nutrition or a physical activity program to every single participant in all 16 of our counties, whether they are as young as toddlers or even older adult senior citizens. And so the programs that we focus on include the USDA MyPlate program. Um, that focuses on some of the five basic food groups that are found within um, the traditional MyPlate initiative. We have the coordinated approach to childhood health or CATCH curriculum. This is our physical activity program geared towards school age children as well as um, even younger students than that. 
to encourage more physical activity within the um, school setting and in their life. We have the Sesame um, Street Healthy Habits for a Healthy Life, and this is for young age children, ages three to seven years old, to start identifying some of those health, healthy foods and healthy habits. We have a Cooking Matters program, which is one of our six week long series that focuses on nutrition as well as um, cooking demonstrations on how to cook healthy recipes with our participants. And I'll go in a little more detail about that here shortly. We have our Walk With Ease program that is geared for adults and older adult senior citizens to encourage more physical activity. And um, this is also a six week program in which we um, try to increase the duration that people are staying active and walking from week to week, as well as to demonstrate various exercises that they could use to increase their mobility and flexibility as well. And then one of our most recent programs is the Go Knapsack program, which focuses on early childhood development centers and providing a healthier environment to um, help those very young individuals be able to um, learn healthy habits at an early stage in life. And so all six of these programs have their own objectives um, that we try to meet by the end of each program. But overall, what we try to do as Clemson Snap Ed is be able to provide a safe environment for our participants to be able to change and increase their knowledge and skills related to that particular health behavior, whether it's active living or healthy eating. We also work to provide um, a change or an enhancement of their attitude and beliefs of that particular health behavior as well. So for example, if we're having our catch curriculum in a school setting and working with certain students, Oftentimes, we find at the start of each class or a series of classes that some of those students may have more of a negative outlook or connotation on physical activity and exercise. And so when we are providing the CATCH curriculum, we're not only trying to inform them on why it's important to be physically active and how to be physically active, but create a space where they enjoy being physically active and are able to develop more of a positive connotation to that type of activity. For our longer series programs, we also focus on developing a more sense of self-efficacy for our participants. And in that case, we are not only trying to provide them the knowledge and skills, but also the confidence and capability that as individuals, once our program is completed, they are able to take everything they know and apply that into their own lives on their own. And so all of these collectively together focus on promoting the particular behavior itself whether that is eating a healthier diet or trying to stay more physically active even after the program has been completed. So what does this look like specifically within one of our programs? Here we go. Um, specifically, we are looking at our Cooking Matters program today, which I mentioned earlier, this is actually one of our most popular programs and it is a six week long course series. But we are able to adapt this program to a number of different uh, populations. We have um, materials available for kids, for teens, geared toward adults, to families, to parents. We also can adapt it for more community settings, such as the food pantries, as you see to the images on your left. And so we are able to be able to work with a wide range of different individuals and people to demonstrate these nutrition habits, as well as how to cook properly the healthy foods and recipes that we are able to provide. Now, even though if we're working with kids or we're working with adults, there's the main components that each one of these series is able to teach and apply for our participants. We include an understanding and ability to identify foods within the basic food groups, the development of kitchen, particularly knife safety skills. So yes, we even teach this to our young kid particip children participants because we want them to develop these skills, but we give them child safety knives. We do not give them um, very sharp objects by any means, but they are able to go ahead and develop the skill on their own for future use. We also um, provide the assistance to be able to read and understand nutrition food labels and learn how to shop healthy and economically within the grocery store. But the most important thing that we are able to teach during this program in this series is the ability to prepare, properly cook, and try new healthy foods using healthy recipes. So we're fortunate enough that in Clemson Snap Ed, we are able to provide the food to be able um, to cook during each of the classes, as well as some of the equipment that's used throughout. We also work with some of our partnering sites um, and having kitchen space, countertops available, as well as stoves and other such cooking equipment available so that each participant can be able to 
cook these recipes on their own while um, over being overseen by the instructor so that they can go ahead and take these after the class has been completed and be able to, apply, uh, to cook at home on their own. And so at the conclusion of every class, we provide the materials in order for them to have the instructions and the recipes that were done within the class by providing them each a participant book as demonstrated to the left here. And so they are able to use these books um, as reference guides for any information they learned in the class or any skills that had been developed on their own. But once the class has been concluded, oftentimes we are happy that um, our participants have learned and have been able to um, gain this knowledge and skills on their own. But they often come back to us with some complications and to applying this within their own settings at home. For example, in regards to the knife safety skills, sometimes we have participants come back to us and ask, well, what do I use if I don't have any knives at my own home? Or is there any way that I can use other utensils in order to cut certain foods? They also um, come back to us that if they don't have regular transportation to their grocery store, then how can they shop for produce or shop for a reasonable um, price in produce? Some counties that we work with, they only are supplied by one grocery store or one healthy food outlet within that area. And so the type of produce that they are available and getting is limited at times as well. And in reference to their ability to prepare and properly cook and try new foods and healthy recipes, oftentimes some of our participants will come to us and I don't have a working stove or proper dishware, cutting boards, or equipment to make the recipes that we made in class. And so these are often challenges and barriers that we understand are an everyday lifestyle impact for our participants. And so we see these as an opportunity to enhance their lifestyles through PSE changes. So how do we do this and how do we go about this as Clemson Snap Ed and working with our communities and our partners in order to do so? Let alone whether it's Cooking Matters or one of our other many programs focused around nutrition and physical activity, in order to continue the behavior, there are five basic components that we try to focus on when we are looking at making sustainable changes in the enhancement of the behavior that our participants just learned within our programs. The first is making sure that there is an actual physical space for these participants to be able to go and participate in whether it's healthy eating or active living. So in regards to some of our nutrition classes, we focus on seeing if there is even a kitchen um, that our participants can go to in order to cook these healthy recipes. For physical activity, we often love to see if there's any type of green space, recreation fields that are available that kids can go to play on and not have any type of motor, um, motor issues or limitations that keep them from running or throwing and being able to fully be able to use that space. The next is if there is a physical space, we look at accessibility. Oftentimes there may be a field down the road for some children, but that, but, and it might only be a mile down the road, which makes it walkable, but it, that mile might be covered in a um, busy highway, which would make it very unsafe for children to be able to get into that recreation space. Or if there's a nearby playground, but it's gated and the gate has been closed, there's not the ability to use that playground due to lack of accessibility. This also includes timing. And we understand that at times that these um, particular uh, physical spaces might be open, may not work well for our participants. For example, many of the farmers markets that we have in our counties are open during work hour and businesses. And unless um, they have evening hours for those who work during the day, it's very hard and it limits the um, accessibility to that farmer's market for some of our participants. We also focus on safety and making sure that everyone is, has the ability to feel comfortable in utilizing those space if they are accessible. So making sure that a park has lighting that when it becomes dusk and the sun starts to set, those kids still feel safe enough in their environment to continue playing. Infrastructure is really looking at making sure that there's proper equipment to be able to continue on with that behavior. So for example, in a cooking class, we wanna make sure that there are working stoves, um, knives, pots and pans available for them to be able to cook um, and complete that meal preparation on their own. And then we look at proper guidelines and legal supports. We try to see if there's any policies available that either support that behavior, the health behavior, or inhibit an, um, other unhealthy behaviors 
within that particular area as well. So what does this look like for our Cooking Matters example? And how have we tried to address some of the barriers and challenges that our participants have faced in the past? Well, in Close and Staff Ed, we try to focus on two different areas. We focus on the site itself that we had the class and hosted the class within. And then we focus on community sports that are available that may enhance our participants in being able to continue that behavior. So within Cooking Matters in the past, we've been able to work with some of our um, past sites to provide proper cooking equipment, um, including stove hoods, knives, cutting boards, pots, pans, dishware, measuring utensils, and making sure that that is available and there at that site for uh, former participants to use on their own. Because oftentimes those are the type of equipment that we bring in to our classes. And so once the program has been completed, they are removed. The next is making sure that there's some type of policy or agreement that participants, former participants can use that space, such as an open kitchen use agreement. And so at times we work with our former partner sites to see if they would keep the kitchen open for our, our participants to cook and to be able to prepare these healthy foods and recipes during business hours, or even once a week during evening hours to accommodate those who are um, working during the day. Once we work with our sites, we also turn to our community supports and see if there's anything we can do to help enhance that behavior. So for example, we have looked in the past to working with local farmers or vendors and selling the food at that particular organization site once a day so that those participants can purchase the food on spot and be able to go and cook it directly in the kitchen just next door. Or to see if there's any way that we can work with local organizations to provide transportation to those who may not have it otherwise to that particular organization, such as working with a local senior center and providing regular transportation to and from the organization and um, for anyone who may be homebound or injured or um, does not have as much mobility at this time to go on their own so that they have the opportunity to cook these healthy recipes for themselves. And we are so grateful to be working with these partners and doing so. But one thing to understand is not every single Cooking Matters program that we have um, results in these specific PSE changes. Oftentimes we have to make sure that we are working to accommodate what may have already been there in the community to see if we not start from ground zero, but to enhance that PSE, PSE change in itself. So what does this look like? Well, for example, I have two of our former participants here, Jill and Susie. Jill and Susie are both best friends and have just completed um, our Cooking Matters with Adult series. However, Jill lives in one portion of the state and Susie lives in the other. Jill lives in County A and has a proper access to proper cooking equipment, as well as a personal kitchen. Her county has over 10 grocery stores that she can go and choose to shop in. And it has a farmer's market that is year round with 30 to 60 vendors per market, depending on the time of year, because during winter months, uh, winter months, vendors tend to um, shorten compared to summer months. And her market does accept SNAP and EBD benefits. So she can use her SNAP benefits to purchase that produce at the farmer's market. Susie, though, lives in another portion of the state in County B and does have proper cooking equipment, but access to only a public kitchen. Her county is serviced by only one grocery store, and that grocery store could be very far away. She does have a farmer's market, but her farmer's market is only seasonal with four to eight vendors, which limits the variety of produce that's available, and probably that produce is a little more expensive due to the fact that there is less competition. And her market does not accept SNAP or EBT benefits. So she is having to pay out of pocket full price for many of the healthy produce at hand. So as you can see, both Jill and Susie, they both have access to a kitchen and proper cooking equipment. They have access to a grocery store and they also have a farmer's market, but there are different limitations that Susie faces rather than Jill. So the way that we approach this in Clemson Snap Bed is we understand that we will continue making PSE changes for both counties. But the, the PSE changes that we do within County A may be more of enhancing those opportunities that are already there and existing rather than County B, looking to see if we can provide such things such as um, you know, acceptance of SNAP and EBT benefits at the farmer's market, which is not existent at this time. 
And so each one of these approaches is quite different. And this works for all of our programs too, where we have to not only analyze what was learned in the, in the actual program in the class, but what is also available in the community itself. So just a few reminders before we finish up about PSEs. The first is that many PSEs um, take time and they take a lot of time to develop. Yes, we're even talking years. But it is always great to be able to enhance and develop these PSEs rather than not trying at all. And so I encourage you to just be patient as we continue to work on these across the state, but also celebrate the small victories that come in the development of each PSE. You might be working in certain stages, and so celebrate when you've completed the first step before moving on to the step two. The second is often funding is a huge barrier to PSE changes. And we've often face this as, unfortunately, in Clemson Staff Ed, our personal funding, we can always provide technical assistance and be able to provide um, opportunities in um, informing what PSEs may be available at that particular county, but we cannot purchase any of the PSE equipment or work in order to do so. So oftentimes we look to grants, whether that's local grants, regional grants, or even national grants, depending on the need of what needs to be changed within the physical PSE. And so in the state of South Carolina, we are very fortunate to have a number of different opportunity, opportunities for PSC grant funding, including what's offered in East Smart Move North South Carolina with some of the recent grant funds that they have allocated directly toward PSCs here in the state of South Carolina. Now these do require some work in searching for and acquiring more information on what's needed to write the grant, but oftentimes can be very successful in the completion of the project and funding the, what you need to have funded for the PSC. Some other things to keep in mind is PSAs are created to support and sustain the health behavior or multiple health behaviors. So one PSE change can accommodate for multiple health behaviors in its own. So Dr. Reed mentioned about the Swamp Rabbit Trail, and that is a wonderful example of how environmental change can support recreational and physical activity capabilities. But oftentimes it's also used as transportation to and from food outlets. So people can go and purchase healthy produce Travelers Rest and go back to the Greenville area and right along the Swamp Rabbit Trail without having any interference of very much traffic or um, anything that would keep them from purchasing that food as well. PSC strategies also need to be maintained. So it's important in the early development stages of planning, who will oversee this new change or this new project? If you're creating a policy, who will be the ones to enforce that policy and continue to enforce it once it's been implemented. PSE changes also, excuse me, PSE changes often cannot be done with, on your own either. And so it's always nice to have a collaborative group working together toward a common goal. If you're doing so within an organization, oftentimes it's the staff, especially the leadership, that help to support that PSC change and exemplify it to the rest of the staff to see and demonstrate the behavior and the changes that are made because of it. There also, we're very fortunate in the state of South Carolina to have many health coalitions in the counties in which we serve and we live in. East Smart Move More South Carolina does a great job in hosting county chapters in which you can find your local county chapter on their website and see how you may get involved. Other counties that may not have East Smart Move More chapters also may have other health coalitions, such as that of Liberal Greenville or the Tri County Health Coalition in the Low Country. It's always important to also incorporate any stakeholders and partners you think will be useful in accomplishing this PSA change. Sometimes it's non-traditional partners. We're talking a lot of individuals from the city or the county that you're representing who you may be able to find a way to um, have access or increase access to a walking trail or a paved path or making sure that the farmer's market may alter and change its hours as a systematic change to accommodate those who work during the day. So these are always things that you have to incorporate while you're developing and planning your PSC change. But one thing to always keep in mind, it is the knowledge, skills, and the self-efficacy that many of our participants learn within our health education programs, as well as the environmental, systematic, and policy changes that are made that help to sustain and create the healthy lifestyle changes that we help promote within our participants daily. And so I hope that you all have been able to take away and see how both program um, outcomes work directly with PSE changes in your own communities or counties at this time. So thank you all so much, and I look forward to hearing any questions you may have.
Thank you so much, Sarah. That was great information. And just appreciate your um, just tying together all of the information that we've heard over the past two webinars. So uh, we are at 102. So I know it's it's already been an hour, but if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat. You can hang out for a couple of minutes um, and answer any questions. Um, if not, if you have to hop off, we respect your time uh, and appreciate it very much. Um, I did want to ask one question um, for you, Dr. Reed. Um, you mentioned um, just that that data can inform policy and influence policymakers. And I think you kind of refer to um, the answer to this, but I would love to hear if you've had the opportunity to talk to lawmakers and policymakers about the data you've collected, either through the legacy charter um, or also with the Swamp Rabbit Trail, if you've had the opportunity to present that to lawmakers and how it's been received and what that has led to. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Kelsey. I actually have uh, numerous times um, been able to present that to to policy decision makers and lawmakers, and it, it is always uh, very well received. Um, I think what happens often, though, is there's limited amounts of dollars if it's looking to implement uh, a built environmental change or we're talking about in the case of, of physical education, um, the simil similar uh, concerns arise of, hey, I, I, I think everything you're doing is, is great and what the school is doing, um, but we have, we have limitations on what we can provide at this particular time. So although they're always very receptive, not always have the resources um, to make uh, to implement and make some modifications. That being said, it had the more you do it, the more people get uh, become aware that what happens early on gets starts to get momentum and then leads to quite a bit of change. And that's where I think we have to continue over and over again, because in the case of, of even the Swamp Rabbit, early on, and this is a good example, early on, um, Traveler's Rest did not want the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Mm -hmm. um, they thought it was going to create uh, problems and and things that they didn't necessarily want. And and But as it went in and they started seeing tremendous benefits from a business standpoint as well as obviously improvements from a health standpoint they came around and and then became such supporters so much so that you had council folks um uh, in in greenville county saying hey what can we do to provide additional dollars uh, for maintenance what can we do to make it uh, more accessible. So what often happens early is you, you get people that say, yeah, I mean, I like it, but I, I don't necessarily have the resources. Or you get people who are not necessarily supportive, but then when the change happens, completely change their opinion. And that's why, when I was mentioned before, policy is so fluid, right? Is early on, you might have, well, I don't think that's gonna be a good idea for our community. And then when it happens, you see people go, wow, that was a really great idea. Um, and how can we make it even better? You know, trails, if we're staying on that, uh, typically real estate prices go up five to 10% when you, when you build a trail. and and many of us were going around and trying to get the stakeholders to realize when, when this trail goes in, you're going to see tremendous change from um, uh, the tax base with more businesses and as well as uh, real estate speculators coming in. Well, you've seen that on the Swamp Rabbit tremendously. I mean, look at where the trail started in downtown at Linky Stone Park. You have the Croc Center. You have multi uh, uh, family housing, trail side, all these other things that people thought, gosh, that's never going to happen. Um, so sometimes the feedback initially is is not what you want to hear, but as you continue and more and more people hear your message, then as Sarah said, policy takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. and But you have to continue to bring people to the table. And as more and more folks hear you, 
um, then constituents reach out to their policymakers, right? Their decision makers and say, hey, this is something I want. Um, so it was a long answer to your question, but I, I, I have received feedback and it's not always what you wanna hear at first, but it often changes. Yeah, that's really encouraging to hear, um, especially thinking about our coalitions who are on the ground um, and who are maybe at the very beginning. Um, so I think sometimes you hear the successful example of Swamp Rabbit and it's hard for some communities to feel like they can relate because we're looking at the after. So it's mm -hmm. encouraging very to hear point. somebody I mean, at the was, beginning right? say that you did face some adversity, you did face some pushback um, and that you were able to continue to bring it up and use data to inform and encourage lawmakers to go ahead and, and move forward. Absolutely. I mean, we had a lot of pushback early on. I mean, town hall pushback. And now our data is being used throughout the country. So mm -hmm. you just have to be persistent um, and no change is not easy, but it can happen. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then I'll ask you, Sarah, I got one question for you too, and then we can wrap up here. Um, but you shared a lot of great information about um, the programs that SNAPED has available um, and then just the great work that you guys are doing to support those behaviors through PSC change. Um, if there's anyone on the call or anyone listening who would be um, interested in, a, in bringing a program to their community like that and getting started, what would you say their next steps are um, in getting this work started in their community? Of course, well, we'd be happy to work with any individuals, whether um, if they are not in any of the counties that we support, we can get them in contact with our other colleagues and other portions of the state to be able to work with those individuals as well. Um, but if you are interested in any of our programs, please feel free to reach out to me and I will go ahead and type um, my email address and everything below that you are more than welcome to just go ahead and reach out as well as if you're looking for any type of PSC changes or you'd like to be involved with any type of coalition work, um, I can help you direct to those individuals as well moving forward. Um, so we'll be delighted to hear from you very shortly and um, look forward to talking to you soon. Great. Well, thank you both again so much for your time and for sharing just about the great work that you're doing. Uh, we are very grateful for you, for you guys coming to present for us today. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We have, um, we'll send out the slides and the recording in the next, within the next week, certainly. Um, and let us know if you have any follow up questions or anything comes to you in the next uh, week, month. We would love to support you in the work going on around our state. So thank you for listening. Thank you to our presenters and hope everyone has a great afternoon. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much.